Bright Racing. On Off The Ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Go Racing. Plan your day at the races at goracing.ie. Welcome along to Friday Night Racing. It's a very wet weekend in Dublin. We've had loads of rain in Britain. Uh, we seem to have actually managed to avoid the worst of it over here, but more rain to come, and maybe the summer isn't going to come at all this year. But it's Friday Night Racing with uh, GoRacing.ie, and we have a special guest today along with John Duggan, who's with me again for the second week running. It's young trainer Michael O'Callaghan. How are you, Michael? Not too bad, Johnny. You, were, um, you got lost on the way, did you? I did. Uh, as you said on the way in, can't take a carry man out of carry. Uh, lifted a bit late. Yeah. But uh, just made it. Grand. Welcome to the the towers. The towers, yeah. Does he, he, he might not quite live up to Paul Carberry, but we have to give him time, I suppose. It's a different sport, isn't it? It is. He jumps in the fat anyway, so I'm, I'm interested in learning about... Uh, I asked Michael off air, so who did you like, you know, apprentice with? Who did you, you know, learn your trade from? And he said, M- myself. How do, how do you do it yourself? Um, yeah, I didn't. Uh, the, 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 the standard sort of uh, training school for trainers would be to be assistant to other trainers and stuff like that. And I didn't, didn't, didn't come that sort of path into racing. But um, yeah, plenty of mistakes. Um, starting off with a few horses, with a couple of horses. And I, I raced uh, bikes as a teenager. Cycling was my sport. And, um, took How did you get into that, actually? Dad, dad was uh, big into cycling when I was growing up. Mm. And uh, like every young lad, your, your dad's kind of your superhero. So I wanted to do what he was doing and got into cycling and, and competed at it for a couple of years. But um, Where were you cycling? Um, yeah, mostly in Munster. Um, Competitively? Yeah, badly. But yeah. Um, but I um, taught myself a lot about training and stuff like that. And, um, then got into got into racing and went to work for Tom Cooper um, as a young lad in all my holidays and school holidays. And after that, I went to work in Coolmore. I didn't really know exactly that what I wanted to do at that stage, but I wanted to work in, in racing. Um, I was kind of leaning towards uh, the kind of stud career because I went to work for Coolmore and spent a couple of seasons there and then went to the Irish National Stud through the course there. And then in that sort of time, I kind of slowly started... Um, leaning towards thinking maybe I'd want to train and um, spent a few mornings a good few mornings maybe with James Burns and the Gallop he was training at the time mm. and, and uh, a few mornings with Paul Deegan as well for, for over a course of a, a summer or two but never really worked for them never was a uh, pupil assistant or anything like that so I picked up a little bit there and um, kind of forgot about training for a while and started uh, rented a stud farm out in Rathangan at about 20 years of age um, that's uh, pretty mad when you think about it. Twenty years of age renting a stud farm. Yeah, young and naive and a bit stupid, but uh, you know, straight into the into the deep end. Um, but started to to buy and sell a couple of foals to yearlings, and um, that only went okay. And then got left with a couple of yearlings, so I had to breeze them. And um, got on well with the breezers. Got on quite well, and um, enjoyed training two year olds. Uh, for the breeze ups, and then after a couple of seasons, um, it inevitably happens. Got left with a couple of two-year-olds, and uh, not really been able to afford to put them into training. Um, so they try and try and train myself, and uh, that that went well. In the in the in, in during that time, mate, uh, we acquired a filly called Borgini, and um, she was my first winner. She won three in a row. That was two thousand and twelve. Uh, my first winner was in is in England actually in, in Bath Bath uh, where they don't water mm. Bath where they don't water yeah, yeah yeah you were very young then you were only 23 or 4 starting off yeah yeah that's all and that was 2012 so what's that 7 years ago so it was 23 just going back to Kerry then when you were back in Kerry was it what, what does a young person of your ilk what's your, what do you expect to do when you're from Kerry you expect to play football or what yeah you probably are you're, 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 you're kind of there's not much when you're when you're at home in Kerry. Um, the world outside of Kerry is pretty much non-existent. Yeah, yeah. Um, you don't have a passport outside of Kerry. No, you would you've gone to Listowel as a young lad to the, the meeting there, the Harvest Festival? Or? Yeah, yeah, mainly Tralee. Tralee was the. I'm from Tralee, and um, the race meeting there was 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 a big thing growing up. It was um, 
a couple of miles up the road from my nan and granddad's house and um, we used to go there and uh, then when I went to work for, for Tom Cooper um, I led up my first winner in Shirley for Tom and uh, I got bitten by the bug very early well at about 16, 17 I remember. Was that around the time of total enjoyment? Yeah that's what got me into it really, that's what got me hooked. The Cheltenham Bumper winner? Yeah she won the Cheltenham Bumper when I was just starting to get an interest in racing and um, Dad was never really into racing either, but he used to follow good racing like that. And his his dad was used to have a bet at Lucky Fifteen most days since he retired. And my job was going to down to the shop in Oakland's and getting them the evening echo, so he could look at the decks and do his his Lucky Fifteen for the next day. And um, when Total Enjoyment won the won the champion bumper, that's really what got me interested. At that stage, I had been riding ponies is all. We didn't have any. We lived in town and we didn't have any You were actually a townie? I was a townie, yeah. 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 We lived in town and grew up in town and um, started riding ponies out, the, out, out about three or four miles out of town and um, used to cycle out there and uh, when Total Enjoyment won the champion bumper I kind of wanted to get into racing and a friend of mum's, uh, her brother was head lad for Tom Cooper and um, Asked, asked the mother to ask him, could I... Could were, you, were you afraid to ask Tom yourself? Uh, I was a little bit, yeah. <laughs> we lived in the same house in the state as Tom. Uh, he only lived 100 yards away. He, he's, he, he often has a long face on him, but he's a very likeable fella. Yeah, he is very likeable, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's fair that the weight of the world was on his shoulders, but... Um, Do you see much of Brian in him, actually? Uh, they're very, very similar. Yeah, I thought yeah. that, too. Yeah. yeah, very, very similar temperaments. Um... Just on Tralee as they're well. Deep thinkers, yeah, you know, yeah. They're they're actually nice guys and deep thinkers and um, put a bit of pressure on themselves. Mm. Um, on, on Tralee itself, I've I've been to every racetrack in Ireland, but I didn't get to Tralee. And wh what is it? What's going on there now? Um, and it, it's obviously sad that it's gone because it was a unique enough racetrack. Yeah, um, it's sad for me that it's gone on a, on a selfish sort of note that. I've never been able to train a winner at my local track. It's still sitting there idle. I think they're on point to points and, and, and flattened meetings there. Um, but it was, during the time of the, the, the Celtic Tiger, it was sold off. Um, it was going to be developed. And Did then, you want to develop it for GA, were they? There was going to be a, a sports facility there, yeah, and, and I think shopping centre and whatever, and it was going to be a big sort of a, a, big sort of a, a development, but uh, that fell through. And um, it's sitting idle. Mm. You know, it's kind of sad. If you were to drive past it now, you'd see some of the stands falling down and it was a great track you know yeah there's nothing sadder I suppose John than Urban Decay like that when you see and I, I often I'd go by the Phoenix Park and even Bal Doyle and think it must have been great to go to the races there yeah I remember my uh, dad got me into racing and uh, you know you'd see in the, the newsprint of Phoenix Park and I never never got to go um, yeah it's, it's funny you know, I was like even watching Chernobyl the other day and going off on a complete tangent here mm. but, which is an amazing documentary and uh, I was in Russia for six weeks last year, and, and, and you did, I did see a lot of uh, you know decay in parts of Russia, mm. and it's um, it's it's sad. Like it's it's there's there's a kind of a there's a an eerie roman like romanticism about an old like a, a racetrack or a football ground or that kind of thing, like a, like overgrown. And I suppose what it, what it's doing is it's it's locking in the memories and the ghosts mm. of, 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 of all those meetings all over the years. It's like railway lines. Yeah. Uh, you know, you were, we were talking about okay, well, it's the the, the railway lines called Key and Clare, where my, my dad was from, and that kind of thing. So you're almost like you're 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 capturing the past in a, in a ghost-like form, and um, we really should be opening race courses, not closing them. I know it's it's uh, it, I, the argument, I suppose, is the locals didn't support it enough. Yeah, but I, I I don't know. Look, I was a young lad. A small crowd would look like a big crowd to a young lad, but I always thought there was great crowds there. And it was such a part of the Rosary Festival. It was. It was a big part. I remember the the Roses really used to come in a strong carriage up the track. And it was a big sort of a deal, but um, but like that, um, uh, there was obviously uh, commercial reasons for it. But like like what John was saying, like uh, a track like that, if the walls could talk, there'd be some stories out of the place. The, the brief tangent now, but there's obviously talk of a second all-weather track in Ireland as well. Um, so that would be the new track. What's your thought on that? Um, a new all-weather track would be would be would be great. Um, 
more central Dundalk is, is a great facility it's quite quite orderly not for, not for us in, in, in the Curragh but for, for those lads that are down down south into Munster down into Cork and, and even Tipperary and places like that it's a long way to Dundalk on a, on a, on a Friday night um, last race 25 past 9 having to head home and it's not you know it's, it, it's difficult on staff and difficult on, 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 on everyone that has to travel that, that length of time so that's a that's a big reason for it but um um, another all-weather track in regards to more all-weather racing I don't know how positive uh, that is for that's my worry because mm. you're diluting the product aren't you yeah yeah. And but the, the all, isn't the all-weather all about like first of all there's two things it's about having constant racing like when, in, when there's bad weather or bad conditions and, and mm. on the winter and that kind of thing but it's also about entertainment so the whole Dundalk thing, and I was there about a month or two ago for the first time, it's entertainment, it's the meal, it's even staying inside really. It's kind of like, it's not a fear purely a racing purist experience. Absolutely. It's, it's like the dogs, mm. but with racing. Absolutely. But if you bring a racetrack in that's sort of not about entertainment necessarily, it's a second all-weather track, but it's more about just providing a facility for horses to run with nobody there. And it's like not necessarily in an urban setting. I don't really see that as a forward step. So it'll be interesting to see what's what happened. But let's get back to your, your early training days anyway. So it happened a bit. I was actually listening to Sheila Lavery. She started training a little bit. Um, I think she was saying she was either pin hooking or she was trying to sell breezes and she couldn't. And in the, she wasn't making a success. So she just started training for a bit out of, um, I suppose, circumstance. But you obviously, you obviously got an enjoyment out of it quickly as well. Yeah, yeah, I did. Um it's 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 the it's the competitor inside you know, just you, you want to win races um i would i'd be I, I'd, to this day i'd be a bad loser um and you have to be i suppose to to try and to keep improving but um but yeah um what was the question again well, you, you obviously st- you started enjoying it at an early stage and you're win- you're an early winner and then you're very very young yeah. and also you were like you were taken over at a time when it wasn't exactly advisable for a lad to get into training, not to mind a fellow who was young, because like the economy was still in recession as well. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, youthful enthusiasm and a bit of stupidity, I suppose. Mm. But um, yeah, how did you learn to grow the operation then? It just grew organically. Um, the 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 uh, enthusiasm in me wanted more horses and wanted. Wanted to try and find better horses, and um, yeah, it just just kind of just grew organically. Mm. You're talking about uh, two-year-olds. You do a lot with uh, Michael. What what is it? What is it like working with two-year-olds? Because to me, they're obviously the babies, and they seem quite highly strung and green. Uh, do you need to have uh, kid gloves when you're dealing with two-year-olds? Yeah, you do to 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 an extent, but not as much as people would think. Um, I enjoy the two-year-olds because basically they're 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 a blank canvas. You can teach them the way you want them to be to to, to learn um, the game, but we predominantly um, are a two-year-old yard in that because we're in one way we tr- have to try and be self-sufficient because we can't rely on on owners sending us horses because it is so um, so competitive. There's so many trainers out there. It's so tough. Um, and that's probably uh, one of the reasons why um, I got into training at the time because I wasn't sort of relying on uh, outside owners to, to send me horses. We were trying to um, find two-year-olds to perform on the track and, and, and sell them uh, to survive uh, that way. So we weren't relying on owners as such. But I enjoy two-year-olds. Um, I couldn't put my finger exactly on why, but I suppose you're, 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 you're looking for the next big thing. You're looking for a star. Um, and we've been we've been very lucky in, in finding plenty of nice horses from, you know, from relatively low budgets. And um, how do you enjoy that? I, like I think if you're a football manager, it's it's nearly more enjoyable to say to the chairman to say to you, you've three million to spend here. You have to be a bit imaginative rather than you mm. can spend whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Who's the Delhi Alley? Uh, mm. He was discovered from Milton Keynes mm, and yeah. Tottenham beat Liverpool to the signature. Who's the Delhi Alley of horses? Is, is is it a bit like I don't know? Only fools and horses when they eventually win the millions. That you're you're hoping for that lottery, that lottery ticket of, yeah. you know what? With this one that's been bypassed for whatever reason or hasn't been seen, or the reading might be a little bit funny, but you just see something in it. Is mm. that is that is that the kind of the dream, or is it a bit more prosaic and kind of um, no? We just need to go through the stats here. We need to money ball. Okay, what what what, what is a good two year old? Yeah, no, there's there's. There's no there's no stats at all really. Or uh, is it feel? Is what I'm saying. Yeah. 
Well, so what, you know, so I don't know this from Adam, say, if I'm a hurler in the ditch, what are you looking for in, 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 this, in this specimen? Um, the athlete, uh, the physical, um, because it's the piece of paper, it's that pedigree that makes them expensive. Um, but as a trainer, I can't train a piece of paper. I have to be able to train uh, the, the athlete and they have, to, they have to be well made, they have to be balanced, they have to have plenty of power. Um, to run as two-year-olds, they have to be um, quite mature. Um, people getting into racing at the start and getting into buying and selling horses, they think a lot of it is down to how straight their front legs are, to the toe end, to how their knees, this and that. For me, front legs are only for steering. Uh, they have to have a good hip, um, plenty of power, well balanced, and they have to be able to, to move and walk and a good looking horse as well. Um, a horse with a, with a great head in them. You rarely see a, a, a horse in a winner's enclosure that looks like a donkey. Um, you know, you buy you buy nice horses, and uh, that's where you start, and that's that's where you can get in at the level where you you the chances of competing at, at stakes level are higher because um, you're not going for for a pedigree, you're going for for a physical, and if you forget about the pedigree, you can buy a horse um, that can outperform what he's what he's bred to be. Um, because at the end of the day, uh, there's no law, but... Um, well, say now or never, right? So now or never is by Bush Ranger, who would have been the next best thing to poison at that stage, really, after, you know, so much promise about Bush Ranger, and Bush Ranger, nobody wanted to Bush Ranger, and then you got now or never, so how did that happen? Um, again, at the breeze-ups, somewhere where we've been very lucky is buying horses at the breeze-ups, and the breeze-ups are two-year-old in training sales, they'd be broken by someone else, they're brought to a track and, and they breeze over two furlongs. So you get to see their action, you get to see them move, you get to listen to how they breed when they're going by you. Um, and that takes away a lot of, of a lot of the guessing because you can you can see them galloping, which is at the end of the day that's that's the name of the game. And um, it was it was kind of weighing the whole thing up. She actually had a good pedigree on the dam side, but she was by Bush Ranger who was complete, as you said, poison. People wouldn't touch her with a with a barge pole, but just there was something about the filly that she was um, she was a very good looking filly. Had she buy, been by something else, was she by Invincible Spirit? She'd have made a couple of hundred thousand because she was a good, very very good looking filly. And you're literally talking pedigree. ten or twenty times the price because of fashion, like as well. Yeah, it's purely yeah. fashion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and very. How did she breeze? Simple. She breezed well. Um, she probably in the top thirty or forty times out of one hundred and fifty horses. So she wasn't in the top. One or two percent, but she was she, mm. she, she was up there. She could move, and um, she was lovely filly down the yard, great temperament, and um, she didn't she didn't like she was she was relatively uh, cheap in, in in buying horse terms. She was about thirty five grand, and um, she, she worked out very very well. She won her maiden in in Galway by seven or eight lengths, and um, she was second to a horse that Jim Boulders called Harold the Dawn in the in the Futurity. Same day as the debutante, actually, which is a Phillies race that she should have been running in, but we said we'd run her in the futurity um, because we thought she was very good. But it was a bit of a bit of an opportunity. The, the Phillies race probably worked out hotter in the end, and she was second in, in the futurity and came out as a two-year-old and won the Guinness Trial at Leperstown. Um Bolted up in it actually, and um, Qatar Racing bought her then, and she went on her next start for them. She was she was third in the Irish One Thousand Guineas, and she was. Um, after that, she went to Royal Ascot, and she was she was a good fort in the coronation. She hit the front of Furlong down and, and uh, just got pegged back. Where is she now? Uh, she's at Stud Summer for Qatar. Mm. And just thinking of her, I remember Kieran Fallon riding her in that trial at Leopardstown, and you know all the um, superlatives that he came out with. How did the Kieran Fallon thing? It was such a strange uh, dynamic because you were very young, and he was probably what the goats of fifty at the time. Yeah. And yeah. and um, this strange sort of relationship developed, but like, what was it like? You know, a fella that you'd be in awe of, really. Looking back, it was a bit mad. Um, <laughs> it was a bit mad, but uh, how did it happen? Um, Gave him a call. He was uh, sitting in. He was over in America, and and uh, he was gone quiet. And his his kind of his career was kind of. He was kind of almost unofficially retired, and um, got his number and gave him a shout. And uh, um, yeah, and he, he he came over and and um, 
lucky enough we had we had now or never to, to, to start the whole thing off and um, kind of was now or never for him at the time as well wasn't it yeah so. yeah it's kind of it's ironic yeah, but uh, what was he like um, nice fella complex yeah um, as it as it turned out he had, he had his own issues uh, the surface later that year they mightn't have surfaced at all if he didn't have um, Adrian McGoldrick who who who's been uh, a saviour to many people in racing. It just to remind uh, people listening in, um, Kieran Fallon came out with depression issues, which obviously um, befell uh, other jockeys since notably Mark Enright, but Fallon was probably the first one. And um, I guess it must have been tricky to be around that as well, even though it, it mightn't have been all that obvious at the time. Yeah, yeah, it was... It was when, it, when it came out, it was quite high profile, but um, in, the, in the week or two leading up to... To, to it being announced, um, um, he just he just went back into himself a little bit, and you could see that that he that he was that he was uh, under a bit of pressure. And um, but no, it, it all worked out well that that he got himself sorted out. And um, you know anything like that, that that ends well is 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 great. And but it was great to have him in the yard and to and to learn from him. He he must have been an asset in terms of work riding and that, and as a judge of horses. Yeah, he was there for three or four months and. To learn in those three or four months off him, the amount I learned off him was just watching him. Um, that's what training horses is uh, a lot of the time. It's, it's observation, and uh, someone like him, he doesn't he doesn't waste his words. Um, but uh, you learn learn from a man like that with a lot of experience. So. Your other um, high profile horse, obviously, was Blue de Vega at that time. Yeah, Blue de Vega, another horse I bought at the Breeze up the bottom in Gorse Bridge, and. Um, Won the kill of Ullen very impressively as a two-year-old. Um, Would you encourage people to go to the breeze ups in terms of uh, an experience of watching, I suppose, um, horses or a blank canvas go flat out for a couple of furlongs? It'd be an experience for 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 the racing fan to go and see them, mm. yeah, especially now that they're only out the road in Ferry House mm. for race course. Um, they were only on a couple of weeks ago, and um, was there much interest in him when he breeze? He made seventy grand, seventy-five grand. So, in the grand scheme of things, a little bit, but not a whole lot. Um, he was by a fashionable salon. Yeah, he was by Lope de Vega, but he, he was a thirty-five grand yearling. He was bought in Germany, and uh, Roger O'Callaghan, Tally Hostel, who we actually bought now or never off as well. Um, they're good producers of horses, and uh, he liked them. The horse had two two big buck shins at the time, which were which are basically sore shins, like uh, a runner gets sore shins or shin splints mm. or whatever. But, um, he just had an engine and um, took a while to. He didn't run his maiden until August. The breeze ups was in May, so it took a while to get him, get him back right. And um, won his maiden impressively at Nace. Emmett um, McNamara rode him, and um, it was quite a hot maiden at, on, on the day. But he just turned into a bit of a, a procession, and we sold him after that. And um, then he won the Kill of Um and again, he was third the same weekend as now or never in the in the two thousand guineas. That what weekend. kind of a buzz was that to have placed horses in both guineas? Um, at the time, I didn't appreciate it. I was uh, probably sour they didn't win. Yeah, I was like a bull. Mm. Went home early, couldn't talk to me. Um, people coming up to me saying, "Geez, that was amazing!" You know, two placed horses in, in the guineas, and um, I see it happened there this year with for Paddy Toomey with Fox Shot Live and Decrypt, and. Um, I was only saying. I only sat back and thought to myself, you know, what an achievement, and for 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 Paddy to to do that, and uh, didn't realise that that I had done it myself. I was kind of a bit peeved, um, but you'd almost forgotten. Not that I'd almost forgotten, but at the time um, things were happening fast, and I was kind of um, winning plenty of races, and they were nice horses, and and uh, just. You know, didn't appreciate it. Like it's, it's strange psychologically if, if when you're very young, things happen and they, ha they happen easily, and you're obviously you take it for granted. And then when you do have a lull, mm. you kind of start to reflect on things and say, like, I'd love to be back there again and actually appreciate this. Yeah, it's not guaranteed. No, it's not. And at the time, I was kind of all I wanted was more horses. And um, is it obsessive? Yeah, 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 yeah. You want, but but. I had a bit of a lull then the year after, in 2017. 
Yeah, because you went back to it's it, you're very impressive since 2014 into this year, which this year is actually your best season yet statistically. Your double figures, which is fair going in a, in the era of Aidan O'Brien to be hitting double figure strike rate, but then you slumped to five in 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we didn't have the horses, um, and that's probably the main thing. We had we had we had a number of horses. We had plenty of horses, but the quality of horse wasn't there because I had gone from sourcing all the horses myself on a limited budget and lucky enough I was able to select what I wanted and what I could train and, 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 and they won plenty of races and, and high, high grade races because to win a maiden in Ireland or to be placed in a maiden in Ireland your horse is well above average um, and from, from that into having the, the high profile horses with Blue Vega and now or never I got sent plenty of horses then um, so You weren't actually picking them quite as much no, I wasn't picking as many at all, very few. Kind of more so relied on the horses being sent. And some by Qatar, obviously, at that stage. Then. Yeah, yeah, some by Qatar and some by Sheikh Mohammed bin Khalifa Al Maktoum. But, at the, uh, you know, it's, they're only testing the water as well. They're only giving you their, their B or C team. And um, uh, you, you have to be honest and say that just the horses, the horses weren't, weren't good enough. But um, you learn from that. And um, it's character building, I suppose. And... Um, you sit back, you sit, sat back in the winter, twenty seventeen between twenty seventeen and twenty eighteen, and um, kind of said we have to strip it back and go back to what got us to where we were, and concentrate on trying to source um, the horses myself. And um, in the last year, it kind of it kind of just started to work out. The horses took a bit of time to come to hand. Um, had had patience, which 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 you have to have. Um, sometimes it can run out, but um, the horses worked out, and we, we hit on horses like like Bruce Wayne and Power of Now and horses like that, and we sold them quite well to Hong Kong, and and were able to um, into the yearling sales then and and, and reinvest that and buy fifteen, fourteen, fifteen yearlings. To go yeah. to war with this year. Can can you explain the Hong Kong market to people um, out there? And uh, was it Gerline sold a horse for about half a million to Hong Kong the other day? I think um, that it looked. Uh, I, I I have to check that now. But it looked um, another kind of shrewd purchase. But what is the Hong Kong market? Hong Kong is in the news for entirely different reasons at the moment. But the market out there for what's the particular type of horse that you would like? And I imagine an awful lot of trainers are thinking, I want to train a horse and I want to source a horse that I can sell to Hong Kong to that various market. Mm. That's what we're trying to do all the time, but it's extremely difficult because you, firstly, you have to source the horse that's good enough for Hong Kong, but then they have to pass a very um, intensive veterinary uh, uh, check as such. They get 36 or 40 x-rays of all their, all their, their joints and um, everything has to be, they basically want to buy a uh, used Ferrari with zero mileage on it as such mm. because um, they will pay you for the horses um, large amounts of money for the horses because it's an extremely wealthy country and the turf club out there the, the Hong Kong Jockey Club as it's called it's, it's, Hong Kong is essentially an island so they're very restrictive on the, on the horses that are let in yeah. and that makes them so valuable mm. because it's so hard to get horses in there and Have you raced over there? Never, no, no. I've Have never, you haven't been there? No, it's never. It's supposed no. to be an amazing experience. Yeah, I'd say that. Um, that him. Yeah. Um, so you strip back and you, you, you then went sourcing horses yourself um, and such that you're, you must be happy that going back to kind of, um, going back to the blank uh, sheet has worked out for you in that regard. So two good seasons now. This yeah. season is flying. This season is flying and... Um, How yeah. did you have my, su- my I'm Superman rated 86 or whatever he was in Leopard Town to start the season? I mustn't have done a good job on him as a two-year-old. But it's amazing how horses improve from two to three. I did think a lot of him. If anybody was paying very close attention, they would have seen that he had a Guinea's entry going into the winter. Um, he walked up in Leopardstown and made it in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. A terrible draw. Yeah, was he, se- was he, was he 79 or 80? He was, he was, he was low on it. But he was second in there, second or third in the current maiden, first mm. time out as a two-year-old. Uh, he was drawn in, 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 in Fox Rock. Uh, that day in Leperson, he was drawn out completely out wide. Um, but he had been working well, and um, the word was he was the best handicapped horse in the Curra. Was that the word? Yeah, I, I didn't really. He was that. he was halfway through the race anyway. Uh, yeah. but he's progressed as well since. Ah, he has. Yeah, yeah, he has. He's improved a lot from two to three. To be fair, um, we did think he was a very good two-year-old. 
um, went a bit weak. He had loads of size and scope, and uh, like anything, like a like a big young lad playing sports, they can just go a little bit weak when they start to grow. And um, we threw him away and, and, and brought him back, and he wintered well, and and he won that day in Leperstown, and he went on to Nace and, and won equally as well at Nace. Um, far higher in the handicap and then we eight, six days later pitched him into the Tetrarch and um, he it was just a bit soon for him but he also lost his shoe early on the race and he had to run the whole race on the one lead um, and horses get tired leading on the one lead the whole time they need mm. to switch leads to quicken in the mm. latter part of the race and he wasn't able to do that having pulled the shoe and um, he ran a good race and finished fifth but it was nice to be able to freshen him up and bring him back and run in the guineas and run in the guineas as, an, as a complete outsider and uh, nothing, nothing to prove no, at no all. No pressure? No, none. So he's going to Royal Ascot now? Yeah. yeah you've, we'll talk to Michael actually about that in a moment because he's a four strong team at Royal Ascot. Um, I just want to mention the nominations for the 2019 Irish Godolphin Stud and Stable Staff Awards close on the 24th of June and there are 10 award categories which carry over 80 grand in prize money. The awards are a brilliant platform to acknowledge and reward all the dedicated staff uh, working around the country. I would encourage all those working in the industry to nominate your friend and colleagues. Obviously nominate them on merit as well. Um, and nominations can be made online at Stud and Stable Staff Awards .ie. Um, Have you been at the, the Stud and Stable Staff Awards night out? Good old night out? Yeah, yeah. good night out. We were there there last year. My wife Siobhan's friend Emma was, was nominated for one and we got the night out in, in a hotel in Mead somewhere and it was... Um, very, very well done, and um, very important in the industry because uh, we were talking about horses there and, and results and stats and this and that, and none of those for for us would be possible without the staff. Who are your staff and in, in your principal staff? Yeah, John Bailey is the head man, and um, he's he does does a great job. He's works very, very hard, very, very dedicated. Um, wouldn't be able to do it without a great team of staff like that. My wife Siobhan is uh, equally as dedicated and works as hard and. Um, all, all the the rest of the lads riders Ian Queeley um, Ian Queeley's with you Ian Queeley mm. who used to ride for, for Pat Flynn Claire lad yeah mm. yeah. and um, he rides Iron Superman all the time and um, and then you, you you have all the other lads that have been racing um, a long time you have, you have Robbie Smithers that was apprenticed to Michael Halford and and um, yeah, there, there's 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 loads of lads there, and they're all going to give out to me in the morning now because not mention them, not mentioning them all, but there's plenty of them there, and they they all do a great job. Siobhan, a racing background? Um, a racing background, no. Um, was into horses most of her most of her life, but uh, racing, no. You've achieved so much. Married at twenty what? Married at twenty nine last 29, year. Twenty nine. Married in his twenties, which few people do nowadays. You've trained. Um, Horses to run place in classics, and uh, he's going to tell us his good thing for the Galway Festival as well. Um, after he tells us about his four horses that are in Royal Ascot, do you have a top hat yet? I have. Yeah. <laughs> the the mad thing about this Royal Ascot is you're going over there with a lot of rain prior to that, and possible soft ground for the Coventry and so on Tuesday. Yeah, they've got sixty mil of rain during the week, like a month and a half worth of rain in one day. But I suppose um, at least you know, you know what it is. You're not kind of, is it, are they going to water the course? Is it, you know what we you're We were getting. talking on the way in that the forecast for Cork tonight was completely inaccurate. So like, you're, what were you saying? There, were like, there, were f there was 15 mil of rain due for this today in, in Mallow. And they got less than one. And they got less than one, yeah. Um, just briefly on that, the weather, we spoke about this briefly on the way, and it, I think as a trainer it would be something that I'd be awfully concerned about, because if you're trying to plan some, how, how, how will you know what the ground is going to be like in Galway, for example? Not a clue. Yeah, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a nightmare, but it's part of it, and um, it's, it's, it's frustrating, but it's completely out of your control. Mm, mm. Um, and that's one of the things that, that, that makes Irish racing so, so difficult and so competitive. Um, it's not like English racing in this that it's not diluted. You haven't got you haven't got four or five flat race fixtures a day. You've 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 three a week. Um, and I think it's great for that because it's proper competitive. It's it's the most competitive race. And winning a race means something. Yeah. Not winning a three run race at Hexham. Winning yeah. a race means something. Yeah, and that's why the prize money is so good. And but because it's it's so hard to win a race in Ireland. Um, and then outside of that, the, the weather is so unpredictable. Um, you could you could have you could have uh, like what you said earlier you could have a, you could have a good thing, and uh, you could be waiting a long time to get his ground, and by that stage you could be gone off the boil or have got injured or something. It's just mm. it's uh, it's difficult. It's part of training in Ireland. It's what makes it so competitive. Will you have a win on Royal Ascot? 
Uh, we'll try anyway, but it is the most competitive racing in the world. Um, it's a lot of people refer to it as kind of the Olympics of, of horse racing. It's just so competitive. Um, there's no point being, um, uh, you know, uh, unrealistic about it. It is a very, very difficult place to win. We've, we've, the closest we've come is finishing fourth in the coronation. Um, but what's it like? I've never been to Alaska. What's it like? Uh, it's completely different to anything else. There's an amazing atmosphere there. Um, so it's like the flat Chapman. Yeah, yeah, I'd say it's uh, it's different. It's is it pompous or is it more everyone is out having a few pints? I have to be careful because I'm going over there next mm. week and I don't want to... Uh, you get booed in the winners. Yeah, before. yeah, yeah, but uh, no, it's not really. It's an experience. It's enjoyable. It's, um, it's, it's part of the... Mm, it's, their, the fabric. It's, it's their identity, isn't mm. it? So you know that, okay, we're going to be dressed up to the nines of the top hat and tails and the ladies can be very dressed well. It's just part of the thing. I don't think it's... It's the, it's the royal thing as well. Like when Michael was on about the Rose of Tralee used to be wheeled into Tralee, like that would be more my scene than the actual monarch being wheeled in. But that is part of the, you know, the national yeah. anthem and furnished the Queen. She loves her racing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the Queen, the queen is... Mm. I like the Queen. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's just part of... Like if you didn't... If you stripped all that back and you just had the racing, you know, everything has to have its quirk. Yeah, yeah it's absolutely. It's a big yeah. show, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Tell us about your quartet next week. Um, yeah, there's three two-year-olds. Um, uh, Red Epaulette, who won the first two-year-old maiden of the year, went very impressively at Nace. Uh, stepped him up to six, then the second time out, and he bumped into Siskin. We made plenty of use of him that day. And um, Siskin's a lovely horse. He's going to Royal Ascot as well, I think. Yeah, yeah. Siskin's probably the highest-rated time form, highest-rated two-year-old in Ireland this year. So he happened to bump into him, and that's what you bump into. And <laughs> that's not even Aidan O'Brien, then. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, it's uh, Gerald Lyons, and he's such a strong team, and there's so many other trainers with such strong teams. And um, which I bumped into him that day, and. Um, Dropped him back to five again at Nace, Royal Ascot Trials Day. And um, in sort of a muddling race, bumped into Pistoletto and, you know, only went down ahead. Um, and I took a lot of encouragement out of that because it was a muddling race. And I do, do think that the fast five at Royal Ascot will really suit him. Um, it's on Wednesday, the Windsor Castle is what he runs in. And um, the ground should still be the slow side of good come that, but Ascot dries amazingly quick. They have got mm. a lot of rain this week and they're raining again today, but it's to be dry over the weekend, it's to be dry next week, so the ground will probably just be the slow side of good. But um, I, think he, he, I think he'd run a big race. He could run the race of his life and finish sixth or seventh. It's Royal Ascot. Um, it's, it, it, we've gone in there with no illusions, but he, he's a good horse with a, with a lot of natural speed and... Um, I think he'll, he, he's in the form of his life and I think he'll run well. You could back him to finish in the first five or six, something yeah, like that, a good yeah, price. Yeah. And you have you've four all together, haven't you? Yeah, we have two two-year-old fillies going as well. Um, Laura Lee Rock, who won first time out at Nace. Um, not having that hard a race, the horse of Joseph's that finished second year first yet, came out and won again and he's going to Royal Ascot. And um, she didn't have a hard race that day and went to, went to Tipperary then for her second start and bumped into Sunday Sovereign. Um, the favourite yeah, for the I mentioned Paddy Toomey yeah, yeah the favourite for the Norfolk and um, he's as good a two year old as I've seen in Ireland this year um, on a par with Siskin you know Siskin's probably the best six furlong horse and Sunday Sovereign's possibly the best five furlong horse and you know we've bumped into the both of them but um, just on that as well like everyone says, oh, you know, Aidan O'Brien and Coolmore, they dominate and all this, but you're mentioning t- taking on Joseph O'Brien, taking on Paddy Toomey, taking on Ger Lyons. Um, we've Lady Kaya sadly lost to uh, the, the Lavery operation this, this week. Um, last year, we had Ken Condon win the Guineas. We had Patrick Prendergast winning a grade one, a group one uh, on Champions Weekend. There's an awful lot of young talent out there. Yeah. I don't think people, like even you see Champions Weekend, how much of a spread there was in terms of winners the last couple of years. Yeah. There's a lot of young talent out there that isn't Aidan O'Brien. Yeah, and you've you've the likes of Willie McCreary and Fuzzy Stack and um, Jim Bulger. You know, there's plenty of trainers there that, given the ammunition, um, can get the best out of horses. Mm. And um, yeah, it's just it's just ultra competitive. Your other two year old then, um, Isabel. She's yeah. unbeaten, isn't she? Only run the once. Unbeaten, yeah. Um, only run the once. We I haven't run her again to get her beat, but. Uh, She's she's a good fast filly. She had a little bit of a of a hold up for about six weeks, and um, she could still she still exercised the weight, but put on quite a bit of weight. And um, 
and uh, went quite lazy in our work. And um, the morning of the declarations for Down I remember from from before Down Royal is is an extremely difficult place for a two year old because it's a bit like a roller coaster. It's up, down, around, across the road. Um, they're turning all the time, and from the minute they come out the gate, they're running downhill. And um, said so to stick the blinkers on her just to give her that bit of help, just to focus. Um, and um, she won. She won well. Won quite impressively. And uh, she, what I was saying about her being a little bit sick um, through the spring, she didn't have a great prep for that race, and she's come out of the race very well and improved a lot. So, will that make her good enough to to to, to feature in the Queen Mary? I don't know, but she's she's um, equally as good and as as, as quick as as Larry Rock, and they're two quite fast two-year-old fillies that. Um, wouldn't be going there unless I thought they had a chance. She's by Cable Bay, so how did that come about that you sourced her? Bought her at the yearling sales in Goffs. I think she was about 30 grand and um, just a lovely filly. Uh, I, remember the, I remember the stallion the stallion racing. I remember being second in the Jew Horses by Invincible Spirit out of a dictat mare. And he was a very, very good looking horse. Um, how important is that in terms of the progeny and, and putting implant like obviously getting the stock actually looking like the stallion in terms of getting those qualities physically? Yeah, a lot of the 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 old boys would say that um, a stallion that stamps their stock is a very good sign, mm. but there's no there's no rules or or, or laws to it. But um, she was a nice filly. She was she was well made and uh, good moving filly, and, and and we bought her, we liked her and bought her as a yearling and. Um, yeah, she's 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 a nice, uh, fast two-year-old filly. She's over pivotal mare, which would which would help help as well. And um, yeah, if, if she doesn't if she if she doesn't win at Royal Ascot, I can can see her um, picking up a bit of black type before the summer is out because she's quite a fast filly. If you if you have the choice of taking a punt in a first season stallion, or a second or third or fourth season stallion that's gone a little bit unfashionable, what would you do? Uh, probably. If the arse was nice enough, it wouldn't matter what they're by. Mm. Um, but them stallions that are gone a little bit cold, if if uh, if there's if there's things about them that that you like, or maybe you've noticed about um, that, maybe they're getting a bit of a, a hard rap because you know things haven't quite gone that uh, fashionably for them. Yeah, um, which a lot of it is. A lot of it's fashion, and you can make your own opinions, and you can sometimes find an edge if you make your own opinion, um, whether it's. Whether it's punting or buying horses or breeding them or whatever, it's all about your own opinion because going against the tide at times. Yeah, mm. yeah. There's no law. John, have you looked at your races at the weekend? Uh, it's not not the best weekend to be honest. And I think when you got Royal Ascot coming up, you know you're not going to get it every day, mm. and uh, that's sometimes what makes the big meeting special. So, um, Mekong, the ground has come from at York in the Nibor trial tomorrow at three o'clock. Ryan Moore, Michael Stoush, keep it simple. Mekong to win at 3 o'clock in York tomorrow. That's your nap. That's be the bet. Uh, I'll briefly go through a few races in Limerick. The 2.50, uh, I think Limerick the ground is yielding, but presumably with rain to come. Uh, Shore Sepp, who's by Footsteps in the Sand, who's a stallion of I Am Superman. Kraken stallion, I think, actually. Yeah, very underrated. Yeah. Yeah. Footsteps in the Sand? Yeah. And he won the uh, 2000 Giddies, didn't he? Yeah, he... But Fallon wrote him. Yeah, but he was a, he was a famous story because um, first time out, he was running against a horse called Olympic, who cost about 4 million, and Jamie Spencer was riding... Footsteps in the sand. He was who was the nominal second string, and he was back from twenties into something like four or five to one. I think at Nace, and he absolutely bolted up. But he was quirky, and um, Fallon apparently was amazing on the gallops with him because he wasn't the easiest. But uh, I love him as a stallion. I have to say, but he's short steps uh, stallion, and that is in the two fifty at Limerick tomorrow for Johnny Murta, another very very promising young trainer who trains up the Curra as well. And um, the three o'clock at York as well is is a is a race to look at. As John said, it is a quiet week end in both Britain and Ireland and strangely enough the, the, the racing has actually been quite decimated in terms of uh, the weather in Britain this this week which is quite bizarre considering we're in June but that's how it's going at the, at the moment anyway. This is a listed race at York um, with a few interesting runners Mekong, a Frankel horse is a four year old is going to be the hot favourite uh, could take a bit of beating. Have you had any Frankels? No. Yes, no. no. What would you say if somebody were to offer you one? Um uh no problem, I'll take him. Um, he's a very, very good stallion. Um, Are they a little bit quirky? Um, 
I don't know. Uh, just from, from the outside looking in, they look to have a lot of talent and there looks to be plenty of good ones, which is a good sign. I know he's got some very good mares, but um, they're able to win at any distance. Who will do better as a stallion, him or Camelot? Uh, so far, I would on the evidence, I would say Frankel, but Camelot's got plenty of good horses and um, went a little bit uh, quiet in his first year, which was which was which was nothing to worry about because they were bred to be three-year-olds. And um, we've a, we've a, a nice Camelot at home that we think plenty of, and he'd be out later in the later in the year. And That's your Galway good thing, is it? Um, I don't know. Maybe Galway um, might be a bit. Um, uh, the in- intricacies of Galway, Michael. <laughs> He's a big horse. And give us a name, Michael. For uh, something for Galway. Something for uh, even even before that. Something to look look out for. Well, for those look watching in live today, my friend Stan has a good chance in the three o'clock in, in Ferry House where I'm going, or the five twenty five at Ferry House. That's that's very good of you. In fairness, you're rewarding the, the loyal three o'clock yeah, listeners. Yeah, yeah. We're you listening? Are you watching this? Yeah. My friend Stan. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I actually do think that, that it's going to be a very, very competitive race, but I think um, uh, the jersey next Saturday, I'm Superman, has, has a, a big each way show because he's the best he's ever been. He's come out with the Curra. Well, he's improved again, which is, you know, it's, it's hard to say that he's improved again, but he, 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 I think he has because, you know, he didn't get a lot of racing at two and um, he's coming to himself now. I think a strong seven furlongs there in, in Ascot will, will, will suit him. But the Jersey, yeah, three year old race, uh, seven furlongs only nearly perfect for him. The Tote.com customers can also enjoy the Tote versus SP best price guarantee in all Royal Ascot racing next week. So, very important to get the guaranteed odds because there will be obviously market fluctuations. Uh, the last race I'm going to mention is the big race at Gorham Park, a uh, beautiful racetrack in County Kilkenny. Uh, just to mention, hard luck lads against Galway last Sunday, but you gave it a good go. Um, no, no harm being beaten by the better team but might meet you again later on in the season um, I've actually forgotten what I'm going to tip here now giving a bit of digs to the, to the got a great welcome in Kilkenny to be fair John Nolan Park lovely place to you, go you got the welcome yeah. the, 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 they spot you immediately um, no, I wouldn't say that now <laughs> but um, they're friendly people down in Kilkenny and they love their hurling I suppose they weren't expecting their first beating there in 70 years no no um, do you like the hurling uh, I actually watched that match but no I don't follow much outside the race you're a bit more you're round enough individual though it's not all about racing um, Anything else at all? Interesting. Uh, um, there's loads. I, I go from 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 one thing to the next. I can't stick to anything. Um, racing is is the main thing, though. And you have the red and uh, blue silks. Why did you make that choice? They're dads. Um, dads, Michael as well. And often we get we get we get mixed up. He's he's the the biggest supporter of mine. And um, I think maybe my mother just liked the idea of navy and red together, and uh, he he picked them. But. Uh, yeah, I know what they've been lucky for us. Um, at a bit of a bit of a pot shot maybe in that race, but I'm going to go with Johnny Murt as guest the bill. Uh, but we're going to mention the nap of the week now. Our total Irish injured jockeys fund earnings currently at four thousand nine hundred eighty nine, eleven euro shy of five grand. Can this week's one hundred euro charity bet nudge it over the five grand mark? And I will give the bet as. Uh, riding in the 6.15 at Limerick trained by Tom Hogan very good run last time in Lestol I don't think this horse has any more to do here great each way but I think if you can get an each way price and uh, Tom Hogan uh, still going strong in in, in, um, in in the flat with his runners including Gordon Lord Byron on Tuesday the Tote will sponsor the full race card for Supporters Day at Sligo Racecourse I might even be there myself second most scenic racetrack in Ireland probably Where's after that? Killarney Sligo yeah yeah yeah, it's a lovely, lovely track, very scenic. Another lovely country track is Gorham mm. Park. Mm. You could, yeah, that, that actually probably be third. Mm. If you're in Sligo on Tuesday evening, be sure to go along and enjoy the racing. Find out more on the tote.com. The tote.com customers, as I said, can enjoy the tote versus SB price guarantee on all racing as uh, Ascot, Royal Ascot next week. That is Friday Night Racing brought to you by goracing.e. Just finally, what are your ambitions left? Uh, keep training plenty of winners, train, train a group one winner, which is, which is the... The, the the pinnacle of it, but um, just keep training plenty of winners and trying to find good horses and uh, keep the head above water. Thanks for coming in. No problem. Thanks, Thanks JD. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks, enjoy John. the weekend and plenty of winners over the six meetings in Ireland. Friday night racing on off the ball. And they're off. Brought to you by Go Racing. Plan your day at the races at goracing.ie.